My friend and I were at a party on the Hopi reservation in Polaka. It was getting late and we had a pretty good buzz on. Most of the people we knew had already trickled out. So we decided it was a good time as any to leave. We looked around for the friend who was supposed to give us a ride because we had all come together. We found him in a back bedroom, drunk and passed out. So we had no choice. We're gonna have to walk. The two of us lived on the other side of the gulch, a good two miles. Between were nothing but trees, scrubs, brushes, and some hills. We had barely cleared the houses onto the road passing between the wooded area when we got this funny feeling we were being watched. We decided to leave the road and cut through the trees. It wasn't the easiest walk, but it would cut the distance down some. And even though it was pitch black outside, we knew the way pretty well. We had been a good 20 minutes off the road and heading up towards the hills when that same feeling of being watched came upon us again. We both turned around at the same time, but it was so dark we couldn't see anything. But then, my friend Paul swore he heard some kind of cackling or mumbling. I didn't hear anything except for maybe the wind and the top of the trees at our back. By that time, none of us was gonna admit it. We were feeling a little scared. Without saying a single word, we picked up the pace, moving along pretty good but not running. And that's when I heard it too. But now, it was more like heavy breathing. Paul then grabbed my arm and gave me a tug forward. We took off running straight up the hill, which wasn't that big, but it was still enough of a slope so I wasn't feeling it in my legs. And on top of that, I was drunk. Think about this for a second. Running up a hill, at night, drunk, complete darkness. And as you're running, you hear footsteps behind you and heavy breathing. Whatever it was though, stayed with us every step of the way. Right at the top, Paul and I stopped and turned around expecting the thing to be right on us. But we were standing there, huffing and puffing, and looking at nothing but darkness. A few seconds passed, and then we heard a thin laughter, as if it was coming from down the hill and back from where we started running. We decided to keep moving and put some distance between us. We turned to go down the other side of the hill, and there, standing right in front of us, was this creature. It was standing up on two legs, like a circus dog, only much taller, with both paws extended out in front of it. It had this coyote face, and it was grinning at us, all of its teeth exposed, and its tongue sliding from one side to the other. I couldn't believe how skinny it was, as if it hadn't ate in weeks. Its rounded stomach sticking out like one of those African kids in the charity ads. And the skin sinking between its ribs. The smell was unbelievably bad. Like the smell of an old, wet dog. We both jumped back with a scream. Like two little schoolgirls. As we did, the creature dropped down on all fours. And ran past us and down the hill back where we had come from. It was yipping and laughing all the way. Paul and I started praying like never before, swearing to Jesus that if he got us home safe, we would never drink again. The laughing, or whatever you want to call it, died down and disappeared. Wasting no time, the two of us made our way down that hill and into the trees that separated us from where we lived. As we walked along, we were trying to convince each other everything was okay. It was only a coyote out searching for a meal. We scared it, it jumped up at us, and then it ran away. We started feeling better about things overall. We got across the open field and into the trees. We made it all the way through there without anything else happening. However, 
Just as we stepped out towards that first backyard that we needed to cut through to get to the street, we heard this unmistakable chatter, like some little monkey laughing coming out of the trees just behind us. It was followed by the sound of something moving through the branches and twigs. My friend Paul then yelled out some words that he said that his grandmother had taught him. And just like that, the noise ceased and it got real quiet. He then grabbed my arm again and we ran. We ran as fast as we could through that yard and out to the road. We ran straight for the house where Paul lives with his grandmother. When we got there, we found her awake and sitting in the kitchen with only a small candle for the light. She was burning some cedar. When she saw us, she put her finger up to her lips and then pointed to the outside of the house. Her lips were moving, but silently. We stood there still for a minute or two, and then she spoke out loud, saying it was okay. She then said a prayer and that the skinwalker was now gone. I have no idea how she knew, and I didn't care. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night there, sleeping where I knew I would be safe. Do you love Native American legends? Have you heard of the goat man? No? Then please, allow me to enlighten you. I heard the legend when a power outage on our reservation made us decide to have a fire. As we all know, nothing goes better with a good fire than a good story. That's where I learned about the goat man. The legend goes that they shapeshift. They love human forms most of all, which is what makes them so dangerous. It's also said that if you find a bone of one, take a picture and keep it in your house, it will wait. For what though, you may ask? The answer is they wait for you to leave. Once you leave, they ransack the place until they find what you took from them. There was even an incident about that night that I heard of, where some people met the goat men face to face. It was a night like the one I was experiencing. Some men had decided to have a fire in the desert and they told some stories about it. Then a stranger walked out of the desert and took a seat, never speaking a word. No one really got a good look at the stranger. One man brought up the legend of the goat man, causing the stranger to listen a little more closely. At the end, the other men nervously laughed, and the strangers stayed silent. The men decided to go back to their homes and put out the fire. They didn't have enough room for the stranger, and they figured he could hitchhike back to town. They had just left when they saw something chasing after their truck. Afraid, they sped up, and the creature sped up its pursuit as well. When it reached the truck, it flipped over and dragged three men off into the night. What happened to them? Well, they were never found. So here I am to warn you and to be careful of the goat man. They can shapeshift, didn't I tell you? That homeless man begging for change that you encounter on your way home tonight could be one or your boss teacher or even your friend this happened about a week and a half ago I live in Washington State I'm a 14 year old male I'm homeschooled so I don't leave the house much and I live with my mom and my dad it was March 7 2022 at about 12 a.m. I was just listening to the old Jenna Marbles and Julian podcast from like three years ago and playing some video games. I was kind of tired and I had just finished eating a snack. So I went to go brush my teeth and wash my face. I did all my business in the bathroom and came back to my room. When I opened the door, my cat was up in his cat tower 
which is right next to my window. And his back was arched up. His hair on his back was all up. And he was hissing. Which I had never heard him do. I look out the window. And standing there is my dad. This gave me a relief for a second. Until I realized it wasn't my dad. It was taller than my dad. And its smile was weirdly big. My dad never just smiles at me. And he's never came up to my window before. What the fuck is that? I said as I ran out my room, crying and shaking. Obviously, because i never seen anything like that before. I went to my mom who was sleeping on the couch, and I shook her awake. I told her to go check if my dad was in the bedroom, and she asked why. And I told her I would tell her after she checked, and indeed, he was sleeping in the bedroom. I told her what happened, and she sort of believed me, but sort of didn't. So she went into my room and checked out my window. Whatever it was, was gone. She checked all the other windows and doors, and nothing was there. She even grabbed my cat, and we slept on the couch that night, all together. Today was the first day I was able to go back into my room, March 17th, and I still haven't told my dad about it. I have no idea what it was that I saw, but the only thing I can think of is that it was a skinwalker. Anyway, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget this. And I'm still terrified that I'm going to end up seeing it again. It's crazy. I looked behind my shoulder like 10 times while writing this. What the fuck? Two years ago... I went to go visit family up in North Minnesota around Labor Day weekend. I won't give the exact location, but we'll provide at least a general location where this happened. To keep it short, I'm hoping someone may have had similar experience or may have had a general idea what this theme or entity was walking around our tent. On that Labor Day weekend, my girlfriend and I were planning on spending time camping with her family. Both of us were very excited to get away from the everyday city life, and we anticipated a much needed low key weekend. We arrived at their location around noon on Saturday, and were all greeted by everyone there. During the day and evening, we were enjoying ourselves with random fun activities and catching up on how everyone was doing. As the night started to settle in, we were all near the campfire for a few hours until 11 p.m. Eventually, the family and ourselves called it a night, and we all headed to bed. My girlfriend and I were offered to sleep in a bigger size six-person tent. It belonged to a relative who I will call Mary. It was a kind gesture at that time, as we only brought a two-person sized tent. Having that additional space for our belongings and our air mattress was a nice added feature. Mary's tent was positioned not too far from the campfire and the rest of the family. The family did a wonderful job clearing and maintaining the area for their smaller RVs and additional tents. To the back of the tent about 20 to 30 yards is where the wood started with semi-thick brush and trees. Us three were laying down chatting and eventually they both fell asleep. For some reason though, I couldn't sleep, so I was on my phone passing time hoping to eventually drift off to sleep. This is when I heard a faint noise in the woods about 40 yards back. I dismissed it right away, as deer are known in this area, and I continued to space off on my phone looking at random things. About 10 to 20 minutes later, I heard something get closer to our tent. I could hear twigs snapping and moving between bushes getting closer to our area. This started to get my attention, as I could start physically feeling a faint shake in the ground as this thing was wandering around. 
Moments later, this thing was about 10 yards away from our area, walking, running back and forth. Whatever this thing was, with each step it took, I could physically feel the vibration from the ground. This thing was big. And the best way to describe this feeling is if you went to a live rock concert and you felt the kick drum hit your body. At this point, I was a bit terrified as I was trying to follow the footsteps, walking or running at the back and the side of the tent. This thing got at least five yards near our area and then suddenly it stopped where Mary was sleeping at near her tent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, scared of what this thing was going to do next. I shit you not, a few seconds later, Mary shot up from being dead asleep. She gasped for air and was calling our names to wake us up. You could hear her voice. She was terrified. This thing hightailed off back into the woods. Both of us were very startled at this point. The woods had become dead silent, and eventually, we got enough courage to look outside. We saw and heard nothing, and about 30 minutes later, we ran to the shop to grab a shotgun. Another anomaly during this whole thing, while we were alert and awake, Mary mentioned during this time I was awake that she was having a dream. She mentioned these things were tormenting her, saying they wanted her soul and to give it to them. My girlfriend dismissed the whole thing and said it was most likely just a deer, etc. running around. After hearing my girlfriend say that, I never told anyone about this story until recently as I started to think about it again, trying to figure out what the hell this thing or entity was. My family has lived in Iowa since July of 2017 and we live in a small neighborhood with a minimum of 25 houses and it is surrounded by a forest. I've seen many horror movies and most of the movies are always in a forest so I've been paranoid and been alarmed. Our dog was getting old so we got another dog. And so now, our old dog has a friend. We named our new dog, Tucker. And he is a very energetic dog with everyone and everything. Our old dog died a few months later. And Tucker was the only interactive pet we now had. A couple of years later, my mom and dad got divorced. And she moved on to a guy that lives a couple of miles away from our house. My mom and dad settle on a schedule on what day they can spend the day with us. While the other go somewhere else for a couple of days. For context, my mom's side is native. And we do believe in the lore of skinwalkers and wendigos. On one of my mom's days, she drives up this road where... It's surrounded by a bunch of trees and a couple of houses and two farms. There is a hill on this road that she has to drive up. And as my mom drove up the hill, she saw something in a field near the neighborhood. What she saw was tall, gray skinned, had deer hoofs as feet. And it was walking into the woods. My mom was confused. And when she reached the stop sign, she looked back in her mirror and nothing. Now my mom was scared because she remembered all the stories of the Wendigo and skinwalkers and drove off to our house. When she told me this, I was already scared because of all the stories I had heard on YouTube. As she told the story, I remember the skinwalker, mostly all the stories of the encounters. I had found on YouTube. After this, I was extremely cautious when I was outside on my bike rides. Without thinking, I rode my bike near the hill 
where my mom saw the possible Wendigo. I brought my camera to take pictures of the landscape because it was nice out, but I became paranoid when I came near to the field, and I always trust my paranoia. As I rode off, I felt like I was being watched when I rode past the field. A couple of days later, it was nighttime, and my dog had to go outside to go to the bathroom. I put my dog on a leash that is connected to the porch and I let Tucker out. I turned on the light that was outside so I could see what Tucker was doing, but I was cooking food in the kitchen for me, so I had to focus on that. When my food was finished, I heard my dog start barking at something, so I walked towards the door so I could see what he was doing. As I approached the door, I can see Tucker is barking at something in the dark. I opened the door more and told Tucker to stop barking and to get inside because his barking could wake up the neighbors. After telling him to get inside, he kept barking at something in the darkness. My paranoia kicked in and I shouted to him to get inside. He kept barking. That's when I started to get scared and I finally looked into the darkness to see nothing but eyes shining from the porch light. As I saw those eyes, my instincts kicked in to pull on the leash and scream out, get inside. Finally, Tucker responds by reacting to the pull and running towards the door. And I slammed the door as soon as Tucker ran inside. I shut the porch light off and took the leash off his collar. I locked every single door and window in the house and covered every window and anything that you can look through. After Tucker was off the leash, he ran downstairs into our basement. So I grabbed my food and went downstairs to keep an eye on my dog. It's been two months since then and my routine when it got dark was what I did when I saw those eyes outside. Close the blinds lock the doors, and turn off the lights from outside. Now, whenever I'm outside, I'm always with a group of people, or I always keep a weapon on me. When I was younger, my mom would take us on a road trip to her hometown of the Navajo Reservation. I would always ask her to tell me a skinwalker story along the way. I remember every story she's told me was when we were driving through miles of nothing at night. Lucky for us, nothing ever happened to us during those drives. Anyways, this is one of those stories that came from my aunt. So my auntie and some of her friends used to party a lot back in the day. They would hop in an old van drive out to the boondocks and just drink and have fun. Of course, this all took place on the Navajo reservation after sunset, but on this specific night, that's what they were doing. Everything was going good and whatnot, when all of a sudden, they hear what sounds like rocks being thrown at their van. Everyone gets quiet as they wonder what the hell is going on. The sounds of rocks being thrown stops, and then something jumps on top of the van roof. I should mention, my family owned a white van that we would use for road trips because it had enough room for my brothers and me. So imagine young me being told a story in a van. Terrifying, I know. So everyone starts panicking and they all hurry to lock all the doors. My auntie jumps in the driver's seat and tries to start the engine. At this moment, of course, the old van then refuses to start. And whatever is on the roof is still up there making banging noises at this point. It sounds like it's jumping up and down. My auntie is freaking out when she sees a hand with long nails reach over the roof and start scratching the windshield. At this point in the story, my mom would take one hand off the steering wheel and scratch the windshield to simulate it. Then whatever was on the roof jumps off. Everyone is still scared yelling at my auntie to start the van and she keeps trying that's when she sees the skinwalker 
walk up to the driver's side window and stare at her just a few inches away. Well, that's when my auntie jumped in the back and started praying for her life. Minutes pass and the skinwalker appears to leave. Then my auntie hops back in the driver's seat and gets the van to start and off they go. I'm not sure if skinwalkers are real, but I have heard stories. A couple of minutes ago, I was closing up my chicken coop so that no critters can get in after dark. And for some reason, every single night, when I go and lock up on the other side of our electrical fence, I hear something pacing back and forth. Sometimes the pacing gets closer, or it sounds like it's going from left to right but never comes close enough. I use my phone's flashlight so it's not too bright, but maybe it sees the phone light and walks where I'm at. Sometimes if I'm out there for a couple of minutes, I hear moaning and weird sounds, sounds that I don't even recognize from any other animal. I live in a small part of my town in Ohio, so there's not that many people. I also don't know that much about skinwalkers, but I'm all alone right now and it's a little scary. I'm 14 years old and I'm house sitting my grandparents while they're on vacation. So back to this thing by the chicken coop. Whenever it walks by, it sounds like it has two legs. So sometimes I think it's a person, but I can never build up the courage to call it out. Also, when it walks by, it makes a lot of noise. I can hear it from 20 to 30 feet away. I don't know why, but the walking around and weird noises freak me out. And just to give you a different picture, the noises weren't human-like or even animal-like. I'm sitting on my bed right now typing this and I'm kind of freaking out. So if anyone's out there, tell me that I'm just a teenage boy who's imagining things and there's no need to worry tell me the tricks to stay out of the way of skinwalkers because I'm starting to get scared thank you for reading this and yes this is very real one summer when I was only 14 years old I spent a couple of weeks at my grandparents' house on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. It was close to the New Mexico state line, even though it was out in the middle of the hills. It was an awesome place. My little brother, he was 11. My grandmother was a great cook. She makes the best fried bread. And my grandfather tells great stories, the kind that you can't hear anywhere else. Now, thanks to that visit there, I have a story of my own. My grandparents have this old guy, a Navajo too, who does odd jobs around the house. His name is Paul. He carries around the silver flask. One evening, as soon as the sun is going down, my grandmother then tells me to take him home. My grandfather is the one who always does it, but he is out at a neighbor's ranch helping with some cattle. I say sure and it gives me the chance to drive my grandfather's old pickup truck, something that I have never been allowed to do back home. But they're on the reservation. No one cares. There's a few people around. It's not like you're going to hurt anyone. So my little brother jumps in with me while Paul and my grandparents' dog climb into the bed. Paul lives in a small hogan, about 10 minutes deeper into the res. By the time we drop him off, the sun is already going down. Back on the road, there's no street lights of any kind. We are driving along when out of the corner of my eye, I notice some movement there in the scrub and low bushes off to the side. I slow down. There are all kinds of sheep around there. The people who own them, letting them roam about the place freely. I don't want to explain to my grandma why there is blood from a sheep in the front grill. As we drive past the spot where I saw the movement, there's nothing there. 
so I resumed speed, bumping along the dirt road without a care in the world. Then out of nowhere, we get a strong whiff of something nasty, as if some animal has died and its body is rotting where it fell. With it comes this sense of deep dread for which I have no explanation. My little brother feels it too and he doesn't say as much, but I can see it in his face. I then tell him that everything is good and we keep on driving. Moments later, I look in the rear view mirror and see this dark silhouette of something very tall and very skinny, covered with some kind of hair or fur running behind the truck after us. Whatever it is, it doesn't look human. My brother sees it too and he starts crying. My grandparents' dog is in the back barking. I'm wanting to make the truck go faster, but the dirt road is so uneven and the pickup is bouncing and shaking all over the place as it is. I'm afraid if I go any faster, I'll crash it off to the road. My brother then starts to scream because it's coming up alongside the truck on my side. I remember being so scared that all I'm thinking is that this thing is going to get us. Then just as I'm ready to cry too, around the bend and coming at us is this car. Just like that, the feeling of dread and panic disappears. Whatever was chasing us is now gone. When we get back to my grandparents' place, we run into the house, checking at our backs to make sure we weren't followed. My grandmother, obviously seeing that we are upset, tells us what's the matter. We can't get the story out fast enough. She tells us it was Yinadoshi, something the Navajo call a skinwalker. She explains that they are people who use black magic and bad medicine. I've been back there many times since then, but this is my only encounter with a skinwalker. So this happened about 12 years ago. My family owns a farm in the heart of an Indian reservation. One winter I was home for Christmas taking care of the farm as I was home by myself late in the night I hear all of our cows freaking out I knew it had to be the wild dogs there are plenty of those in the area so I throw on some boots grab a shotgun load it up and head out to the field this was a perfect scenario for a horror movie it was cloudy but there was a full moon and it was breaking through the clouds just right to light up all the snow I ran out into the middle of the field and just in time I see two dogs but they were standing up facing each other and fighting I think perfect two for one so I pump a shell into the chamber of Mr. 12 gauge and then it happened the two dogs heard the rack they both stopped looked over at me and ran away on their back legs I froze and every ghost story about skinwalkers and all the other native legends I grew up with came to my mind. Also, keep in mind that I am a white guy. And up until then, these were all just boogeyman stories that the native kids like to tell to scare us. But that night, they became real to me. My uncle is Mexican and Native American. This happened in the Mojave Desert in South California. He was driving around with his girlfriend late at night and they saw something that looked like a huge black dog on the side of the road. He slowed down and the dog then began crossing the road. Instead of walking like a normal dog would, this thing moved like a toy rocking horse. He said it stopped in the middle of the road and stared at them and its eyes had a red glow. My uncle is the most badass person I know and it scared the shit out of him. A man from the reservation has just delivered a bull to a buyer's ranch out to the far reaches of the reservation. Getting lost in a couple of hours, it is a large expanse of land and what maps are available. 
aren't always available. Anyways, it's late and getting dark by the time he gets home on the main road towards home. Just as he gets to the intersection where there's no stop sign, he sees up ahead, right in the middle of the road, a lone coyote. It's just standing there. So before he starts driving, he leans on the horn. In response, he watches as the coyote raises up on its back legs. It assumes the form of a man, only his legs and feet. Arms and hands seem more canine than human. And with a spastic gait, it starts walking towards the opposite shoulder. The man, not believing what he's seeing, closes his eyes and shakes his head. When again he looks, there's the coyote sitting off to the side of the road and looking back at him as if it's waiting on him to drive by. The man, certain that it's the lights playing tricks on him and the fact that it has been a long and draining drive. However, as he passes the coyote, he gives it a quick look and he sees that this coyote is grinning back at him. Having heard stories of skinwalkers, the man blesses himself and he fixes his eyes on a road ahead. Me and four of my buddies on a reserve. Day one about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a fat black bear. We only had what you call muzzle loaders. They are like a Civil War style gun. You get one shot, then you gotta reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer, so at 2 p.m. after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We end up finding a hellacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him pick me up I'll be on the road after dark. He's about 7 miles away. I sit there from 2 p.m. till dark and all I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway, so it does get dark and I creep down to the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see something crashes into thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I'm thinking that maybe it's a deer, so I call just to get a reaction, but nothing. So I creep on it, thinking I can bust it if it's a deer, but it doesn't move. He's just sniffing like a dog. Sniff, sniff, sniff. I kick the ground and stop trying to bump it, but the dog just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear, and I'm 10 feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm gonna have to hip shoot it if it's a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot, a big elk off to my right in the full moonlight. I see something drive out of the bushes into the thickest part in the road to my left. It's a standoff, eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart, four foot off the ground. It's just sniffing over and over. It's full, dark, and this thing is stalking me using cover. My buddy lights start shining down the road, and this thing crashes through the bushes away. I figure it's a bear, but I don't know. I was a little bit scared, I'm not gonna lie. I had one shot in the dark, coyotes howling like crazy too, and the predators were out in full effect on the full moonlight. I heard of skinwalkers before, but I always assumed they were the Native American version of werewolves, so I never gave them much thought until last week when one of my co-workers in my new job told me that they were his most feared folklore creatures. He's originally from Utah, so that makes sense. He suggested some YouTube videos to watch on the subject and after work that night I watched about four or five of the videos. Now I totally understand his stance on them now. 
I live in South Carolina. So to be completely honest, I wasn't too worried about the possibility of running into one. My coworker told me that they were basically a Midwestern thing. I would be more worried about Wendigos if I were you. He joked the day after I watched the videos. We had a good chat about skinwalkers and Wendigos during our shift and just revel in the creepiness of them. I mentioned how one of the tales said that the more you talk about skinwalkers, the more they're drawn to you. And he made sarcastic ghost noises to keep the mood light. The night I showed the videos to my fiance, she was way more creeped out than I was. I became kind of obsessed. I love scary things and couldn't help but watch every video I came across. I talked about skinwalkers with my other friends who love horror, looked up skinwalker art, read true skinwalker stories on reddit, just drove head first into all things about skinwalkers. This went on for a few days until I started feeling a little burned out on the subject. I live in a fairly nice neighborhood where all the houses are on one side of the street. On the other side is land that used to belong to the local elementary school. The building is on the next street over. So basically, it was like the school's backyard or whatever. However, the school shut down about 30 or 40 years ago and the county just let nature reclaim it. So directly across from my house is an old chain link fence and just overgrown woods. Two nights ago, I was smoking a cigarette and I heard some leaves rustling across the street. I didn't bother looking up for my phone. I live across from the woods, so it must have been a deer. The rustling stopped, then it started again, and it sounded like whatever was over there was running back and forth along the fence line, panting like a dog. This, however, caught my attention. There had been a few cases of rabies in my town because of a strange dog that was running around in the middle of the night and it was definitely something I wanted to keep my eye on. I look up from my phone in the direction of the sounds and they just stopped. It was like the thing knew I noticed it. I strained my eyes trying to see what it was, but it was obscured by the overgrowth. I didn't look away, must have stared at the spot for at least a minute. It didn't make another sound, didn't move, so I knew it was still there. A chill ran down my spine, and I began thinking of every skinwalker video I had watched over the last week, and I felt sick to my stomach. I quickly put out my cigarette and went inside. The next morning, I took my dog out for a short walk. She's a pug zoo named Honey and is like my child. Me and my fiance taught her that pee pee poo poo means it's time to go outside to potty. It's the cutest thing. Anyway, this particular morning, I take her out to the front yard to do her business. She pees and then walks around sniffling for about five minutes before walking to the side of the street and sitting down. She's never done this before, so I was a little annoyed. I tugged on her leash lightly and tried to bring her back towards the house. Come on, honey, got a poo-poo. She didn't budge. This dog could be stubborn sometimes, but this was something else. She tugged back against the leash and just stared across the street, sniffing the air occasionally. It was then at that moment that I realized she was staring at the exact spot that I had heard the thing the night before. I got goosebumps and I quickly picked her up and began walking back to the house. As I got closer, I noticed something on the ground by my front steps. It was one of the Halloween decorations my fiance had put up on our house. Plastic black roses with plastic eyeballs and spiders on them. 
The stems were wire, so they can be wrapped around things to keep them secure. This flower was torn apart. Something had come into my porch, taken down the flower, and torn it apart, leaving it in the front of my steps. I picked up the flower and threw it away. I didn't tell my fiance. I didn't want her freaking out. The rest of the day went by uneventfully. That night, I told my coworker about what happened, and he looked a little concerned, but brushed it off. He said what I heard was most likely just a dog, and the flower was most likely knocked down by the wind. I had my doubts. As I was walking to my door after getting home from work last night, I heard some panting as the night before and the clicking of claws against asphalt. I turned quickly to see a dog that looked like a brown mangy bull terrier hauling ass down my street. The street is about 40 feet away from my front porch so I couldn't get a great look at it but I could tell it was only running on three legs because one looked mangled. It turned quickly and darted into the tree line across the street through a part of the fence that had been pulled back. The fence wasn't like that earlier in the day and that's when I noticed that the dog didn't have a tail. I almost threw up. Skinwalker legend says that when they take the form of an animal they never have tails. I tried to rationalize it to myself. Maybe it just had a stub tail that I missed because it was running. However, I immediately went inside. My fiance was sitting on the couch petting honey. She could see I was upset and asked me what was wrong. I told her nothing, just almost got clipped by a car before I pulled into the driveway. She got up, hugged me, and cursed the person that almost hit me. She then asked me if I could take Honey out for pee pee poo poo because she had been creeped out by all the spooky videos we've been watching and didn't feel comfortable going outside at night by herself. Honey perked up. She ran to the door and looked between me and the door all excited. I stared down at her for a moment before agreeing to it. I'll just keep her close to the porch, I thought. We walked off the porch and she quickly tried to walk to the street. I tugged on the leash and she tugged back. She eventually moved to the edge of the porch and peed. After she began walking around sniffing, I told her the usual line. Come on honey, got a poo poo. She huffed at me, sniffed around some more and eventually started pooping. I was on the edge the entire time we were outside, but being around her helped me calm down just a little. Then I heard it from across the street. Come on, honey. My voice and the exact same tone and inflection as I had just said it, it sounded staticky like an old radio broadcast, but it was definitely my voice. Honey then stopped what she was doing and stood alert. She looked over to me and cocked her head. Come on, honey. Got a poo-poo. Again, my voice called from across the street. Honey began whining, looking from me to the woods across the street. I picked her up and I began backing up to the steps, not taking my eyes off the part of the fence that had been pulled back. Honey, come. The voice sounded firm now, like it was getting aggravated. Honey squirmed in my arms, whining. I didn't know if she was trying to get out to go to the voice or to run inside, but I wasn't taking any chances. I turned and bolted up the steps and to the door. As I walked inside, I turned one last time to look across the street. There. Standing in the part of the fence that was pulled back was the dog. Its eyes were glowing a dull orange and it had its teeth barred. The face was all wrong. 
like someone had taken a distortion tool and just dragged around random features. Once again, I didn't tell my fiance. Stupid horror movie cliche shit, I know, but I really didn't want her losing her shit. I just told her there's a strange dog running around the neighborhood, so to not take Honey out at night. Later that night, after we had gone to bed, I woke up to the sound of footsteps pacing back and forth outside my window. Against my better judgment, I rode over to try to see it, and then the pacing stops. Come on, honey. My voice called out, cutting through the quiet of the night. I prayed my fiance didn't hear it. It called out two more times before I heard it walking away. I didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Today, when I get to work, I'm going to ask my co-worker what I can do to get rid of this thing. Um, scare. I don't think there's a way. But if anyone knows anything, please let me know. Come on, honey. Okay, so I've been a skeptic of creepy paranormal things my entire life. I have never believed in that type of stuff. But the things I have heard, witnessed, and my grandparents' farm shakes me to my core. My grandparents own a large plot of land in central Missouri, and they have owned that land for around 40 years. I've been to that farm over 10 times and every time I go I always get this terrifying feeling that something is watching me like there's always something behind my back I have also had many strange encounters that are downright bizarre my first encounter with whatever the hell this thing was was when I was around the age of 7 or 9. I'm currently 14. We had brought our dog named Spot to that farm. He was a silver lab who I loved dearly. I was exploring the forest behind the house, just enjoying the summer breeze, when my dog started growling. A deep, sinister growl that I had never heard him make. I turned around quickly to see what he was growling at, but I couldn't see anything but forest among more forest. While my eyes were scanning the area of where my dog was growling, some animal shot out of the brush so fast I could barely see what it was, and before I knew it, it was gone. I sat there for what felt like an eternity absolutely flabbergasted by what I just witnessed. From what I could see of it, it looked like a coyote, but the speed at which it moved was absolutely insane. It moved like at 90 miles an hour and made almost no noise. But the most creepy part was that the place it jumped out of didn't even make an imprint of where it was laying. And from where I viewed it jumping up, I should have been able to easily see where it was hiding. Shocked by what I witnessed, I just decided that was enough and went back inside the house. My second encounter happened when I was around 10. I was visiting the place and like usual, I was getting the feeling I was being watched. That first day was normal and nothing really creepy happened. I was just spending quality time with family. But when night came, that's when shit started happening. I was trying to sleep in the twin bed that was shared by my mom's brother when he used to live there. That's when I heard tapping. Not tiny little taps, but loud tap. 
almost like it was banging. It was coming from the direction of the window. I slowly sat up and looked at the window, but there was nothing. So I assumed it was just some animal or something like that. Five minutes passed and no tapping and I was drifting off to sleep when, this time, not a tap, a slam, a loud slam directly into the window. I'm not talking about like a hit, it sounded as if something absolutely massive hit the window. I shot up so quickly I nearly passed out. I decided enough was enough and grabbed the flashlight in the drawer and shined it out the window. Nothing. Ten seconds passed. Nothing. I was about to go crawl into my mom's bed when I heard it. A screech. A screech that was not achievable by any human. So loud it pierced the quiet peaceful summer night. I can't put into words what that sound sounded like, but it was dark and horrible, and I still remember it to this day. I froze, unable to move muscle. I was so scared. I was sitting there still as a statue, petrified by what I heard. That's when my instincts kicked in, and they told me to run into my mom's room, which I did. For some reason, I didn't wake her up. I just cuddled up next to her and didn't sleep the entire night. All I could think of was that sound, that horrific, terrible, bloody screech. My next encounter was when I was around the age of 13. I was back at my grandparents, just enjoying my time. Like I always do, my grandpa suggested that we go deer watching. I agreed because I had been doing this since as long as I could remember. And it was never an issue and it was extremely fun. So we took the Polaris and we went around 6 to 7 p.m. to look for deer. We decided to go into the most eastern pasture because that's usually where we spotted the most deer. 30 minutes passed and we had seen a few deer but not as much as we usually do. But then, this is where the shit begins. I get that feeling again. That dreadful feeling that something is there. And the shadows watching me. But this time, it's a lot more intense. Like if it's right up behind me. But when I look, it's never there. But this time, it appears that my grandpa feels the same presence as me too. And just to let you all know. My grandpa is a very laid back individual, always joking and having a laugh. The only time I see him be very serious is when my great uncle died a couple of years ago. So when I started feeling that I'm being watched, my grandpa goes from a happy and laid back expression to very serious and alert. He gripped the wheel so tight, his knuckles turned white and he was just looking around like to make sure something wasn't following us. He then made a massive U-turn out of nowhere and started heading back to the house. I asked him, what are you doing? And he replied with, we're heading back to the house. The tone of his voice was cold, like he had witnessed someone being murdered. At this point, he was gripping the wheel even harder and was absolutely going pedal to the metal full speed back to the house. I decided not to ask any questions until we got back to the house which we did in no time at all. Once we were there he rushed me into the house checking his back to make sure something wasn't there. When we were inside he closed and locked the door tight. His behavior was very alarming and it really shocked me to my core. I then decided that all of the stuff I had witnessed was enough and I only asked them one question. What the hell is going on here? When I said that, he looked at me and gave me a cold expression and said, 
I have some things I need to explain to you. We then sat down for 30 minutes and he explained that whatever this thing was, it was living on his property and it has been here since the day he moved in and he and my mother experienced the same thing that was happening to me the very first few years of living here. He explained that he has seen whatever this thing is and it doesn't like new visitors. He told me about all the things he had witnessed and experienced and they seemed to have been very pretty similar to what was happening to me. He told me that he knew this was going to happen to me and that he was always watching to make sure I never got hurt because he knew this creature better than anyone else. We talked some more but all of it was the same. It was now late and he decided that I couldn't sleep alone so he had me sleep with my mom. We promptly left the next morning. I have not been back since that day. This last encounter isn't really an encounter. Two things have happened at my grandparents' farm. Recently, we brought my sister's horse to the farm. The first night for the horse was hell. My sister's horse has always been very friendly and not shy. But the first night of my sister's horse being at the farm was bizarre. The next morning, my grandpa woke up and was doing his usual chores and went to go feed the horse. He noticed that the horse was acting very weird, extremely shy and timid. But when he took a better look, he was shocked. The horse had three 10 inch gashes down its side, like something had clawed at it. It was ruled out that the horse ran into the fence, but I think otherwise. Also, around the same time, my grandparents adopted a dog and named it Panda. Panda was a Jack Russell Terrier who was two months of age. Five days later, he was found dead with deep puncture wounds on his body and with his neck slashed up. They said it was a bobcat or mountain lion, but I also think otherwise. Super creeped out by my experience I had over the weekend and curious what others think. I was driving through a rural part of North California, 30 miles from the nearest town. As I was driving down the road, a deer ran out in front of my car. I had no reaction time and I hit it at 55 miles per hour. It ripped my bumper off and the bumper was dragging under my car. I pulled over and called my dad for help. I then get out to look for a deer in the road. I know it was dead because there was blood sprayed all over my vehicle and I hit it square on. I walked around 20 to 30 yards away and I got an overwhelming sense of being watched. I couldn't find the deer so I turned and speed walked back to my car. It was around 7 p.m. and it was extremely dark. No other vehicles were driving by, no street lights, and barely any cell service. My dad was over an hour away, so I called a friend who lived a little closer, and he started on his way to me. While I sat in the car playing on my phone, I began to hear whistling and murmurs outside my car. I got chills and the hair on my arms and neck stood up. There was one house to my right, but I didn't see any vehicles in the driveway or people moving or people moving around inside. I was on the side of the road by myself for 45 minutes and would occasionally hear these noises. I'm not sure what or who it was, but if anyone has any ideas, I would love to hear. I'm freaked out and I'm now scared of being outside in the dark. 
by myself. Thanks. My roommate has told me the story a few times and I want to see if anyone else has had similar experiences. As he tells it, he was driving home super late at night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m. in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, both times that this occurred. The first time, he was driving alone on a road that has an open field to the left of it, when out of nowhere, a black figure on all fours bounds up out of the field, comes up out of the field and across the road in front of his car. As soon as the figure got to the other side of the road, it stops with inhuman quickness, turns around and looks directly at my roommate. He described the figure as looking simian, completely black, except for the face. The creature's face was a stark, white, human face. Not white, as in Caucasian, but white, as snow. This happened again a few weeks later, but this time, the creature was sitting in a tree. As his car approached, it climbed down the tree, again, with quickness, bounded across the road, stopped on a dime, and turned around and made eye contact with him. This time, he had a friend in the vehicle who also saw it and began freaking out. It was the same exact thing as the first time. A simian black body with a snow white expressionless human face. My roommate, as always, the curious one, turned the vehicle around and began searching for the creature but it was nowhere to be seen. While trading stories around a campfire, my friend recalled an encounter he had while serving an LDS mission. My friend's mission region had a reservation within its boundaries. However, it was far from where he was serving. On one occasion, him and his mission companion were told to travel more far than usual to meet with some investigators. This, however, took them near the reservation. On their way home, their car ran out of gas, and it wasn't until late at night that they were able to continue the journey home. My friend, who was driving while his companion slept in the passenger seat, chose a different route that took him through some back roads in an attempt to try to get home sooner. He told us he was driving above the speed limit when he noticed movement in the woods lining the road. Because coyotes were common in the area, he took little notice first. Then he looked out the window and slammed on the brakes. The sudden stop made his companion awake, who wanted to know what was wrong. My friend was shaken and said he would tell him once they got home. He only told him to say a prayer. By the time they made it home, his companion was dying to know what happened. And my friend told him, as I was driving, I looked down at the road next to the vehicle. And I saw six men running on all fours keeping up with the car. I was driving 40 miles per hour. This is my father's story, written from his perspective. When I was about 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone. A lot like our house now, it was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to the Hymas festival and left us to tend the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs 
going crazy outside, thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance. We screamed at them to be quiet. We began to fall asleep, and the dogs would not be quiet. Somehow, I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then, I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house except for my brother snoring. I then realized I needed to use the bathroom, so I woke up my brother to take me to the outhouse in the back. He teased me about being scared, which I was. We went out with our flashlight to the outhouse. The dogs then began with their crazy barking out in the brush, going from one place to the next. My brother went first and I waited outside for him while I was waiting. I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight. Then there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Everything went quiet again. It was way too quiet for that time of the year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly I heard a few of the dogs by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man. He was unbelievably tall, leaning one arm on the cab roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little bit and then suddenly kicking one of them, making them scatter in different directions. The thing then looked up at me and I saw its face. It had a pure white face like a full moon, two burning red eyes, and a slight smile that was pure black. I could not move or make a sound. It began to walk towards me with long strides until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was dark red, like the color of the blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. I kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of that outhouse. With this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted with his buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed that this thing had long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move towards my brother. Finally, noticing this figure, my brother became paralyzed as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out towards my brother's head. When something finally snapped in me, I became unbearably angry. I broke from this trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and baring my teeth at it. A growl came out that I never knew I could make. I became more and more angry at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. Finally, with everything I had, I began to make this primal roar at it. It fell backwards and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull, its smile now long gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the festival. After telling the story to my parents, they quickly hired a medicine man. I don't know why I'm here. I shouldn't have come. I knew I shouldn't have accepted the dare. Well, I couldn't back down from a double dare, could I? My name is Jacob, but my friends call me Jake. My friends had dared me to come here at midnight to prove 
I wasn't a pussy. There was no way I could back down from a double dare. As everyone would know, I was a coward. My friends and I were in the woods near our town. Just messing around. You know, teenage stuff. Our parents had always warned us to stay away from the woods as anything could happen in there. Of course, we didn't listen to them. We were 15, and we thought we knew better than them, as every teenager does. Our town's woods are like any town's. Parents warn us not to go in as a child, leading us to create fantastical tales about creatures living in the woods who only come out at night with the body of a deer and torso of a man with unicorns and dragons living in the deepest of the green utopia when the sky turns into an inky black of course we outgrew all of these childish creations and fantasies and we grew up to enjoy the woods often going in there to enjoy a sneaky smoke or to take their new girlfriend away from the prying eyes of their parents. We had entered the woods at just about 4 p.m. It was autumn and the clouds were hanging low over the treetops, looking pregnant and black, threatening to burst and shower us in heavy rain that had been expected for weeks now. My friend, Sam and Archie, were with me. Archie is my best friend. Ever since we met in second grade, we had gotten on like a house on fire. And now, we were practically inseparable. Sam was a big dude, towering over us at 5 foot 11, at just 15 years old. He was the guy you always wanted on your side when you got into a fight. Me and Sam didn't get on this very well. We had only met through a friend of a friend type thing and had never really bonded well. Sam was doing his usual bragging about the stuff he's got up to last night with his girlfriend that we all knew were just over exaggerated fantasies. We had just arrived at the clearing. That was its name. Everyone just called it the clearing. It was exactly that, a clearing in the center of the woods, with a large boulder in the center, that as kids, when we walked through the woods with our parents, we would climb to the top and yell funny phrases from our favorite cartoon at the time. We walked where the boulder was at, and our conversation tuned towards movies. We had all recently seen a horror movie together and were just making comments at how we each saw the other flinch at certain scenes. Both Sam and Archie were claiming that I was the only one who jumped the most. And of course, like any testosterone driven teen, I was on the physical defensive immediately, jokingly pushing Archie off the rock and kicking him lightly. They both talked about how I was always a pussy when watching horror movies, always jumping at every shadow after the movie too. One thing led to the other, and before I knew it, I had been dared to prove that I wasn't the coward they were claiming I was. I had to stay in the woods with them until midnight, and then they would leave me alone for an hour to see how long I would last in the dark woods on my own. I was hesitating to accept it there, thinking of my parents and stuff, and it being a school night. But then Archie went and double dared me. You can't decline a double dare. I had to accept the challenge. We hung around, waiting for midnight to come. They continued their conversations, but I couldn't get involved. I was far too nervous, dreading the moment I would be left alone 
in these dark woods. They had promised me they wouldn't be too far off and that they wouldn't be able to hear my girly screams, quote Sam, if I got too scared and wanted out of it. It wasn't the dark I was going to be scared of. It was what was unseen in the dark that worried me the most. My hands were shaking and I couldn't stop my breathing rate to increase as the minutes ticked down to midnight. Just 10 minutes to go, 10 minutes, and then an hour standing in the pitch black woods in the clearing. Proving to my friends I wasn't a coward, was it worth it? I asked myself. I didn't know. To live for the rest of my friendship with them, being called a pussy, or to stand through 60 minutes of sheer terror and dread. Damn it. I shouldn't have watched so many scary movies. My mind was a blur. My vision couldn't focus. I kept seeing things in the corner of my eye. Shadows behind trees that moved out of sight when I turned my full attention on them. Footsteps behind me. I knew it was all my imagination though. Just my imagination. Hey, Archie's voice cut through the mist in my mind. A deer. I squinted through the darkness in the direction he was pointing. Where? I heard Sam ask. Shh, you'll scare it away, Archie hissed. He gestured with his hand to the left side of the boulder, middle distance. And sure enough, there was a deer. It was standing still, absolutely stock still. It wasn't grazing the grass, it was looking around for possible dangers or predators. It was just standing there with its head pointed straight looking east. It's beautiful ain't it? Archie said smiling at me. I nodded my mouth still dry with nervous anticipation. I pulled out my phone to check the time to see how long I had left before I was left alone in these woods. But Archie stopped me, grabbing my hand and shaking his head. No, he whispered. The light from the phone might scare it away. I put the phone away and squinted through the darkness again at the still, motionless deer. We stood there for a few minutes, watching it. It hadn't moved once. Yo, why isn't it moving? Sam asked. Then the deer moved. I saw it. Just as Sam had said those words in his deep whisper, the deer turned its head to look at us. I felt a shiver go down my spine. I don't know why, but the way it had turned its head to look at us didn't seem right. The movement wasn't fluid. It wasn't like the deer was afraid of the noise and had whipped its head around to check it out. The deer had turned its head too slowly, too slowly for an animal of prey, hearing an unknown sound. It stared at us. We stared at it and nobody moved. The woods were silent. It was as if the trees and animals were all holding their breath in anticipation of what was about to occur next. It then moved again, so slowly, so unnaturally and slowly. It started to walk. I don't know if walk is the right way to describe its movements actually. It was more forced, as if its legs didn't belong to it and it was trying to figure out how to use its limbs along the way. Jerky and slow movements, moving away into the darkness until the blackness surrounded it and we could no longer see it.
None of us said anything for a long time. Sam turned to us. He ruined it. Of course he would. Enough of that weird ass deer. We're here for a reason, right? I could do nothing but stare at him. My heart beating so fast in my chest and my head swimming with thoughts. Archie didn't respond. Well, Sam demanded. Archie looked at me. I couldn't move. Fear had paralyzed me. I was scared of what I had just witnessed and the strangeness of it and the fear of the dare. Archie then shrugged at me. A dare is a dare, bro, was all he said to me. Taking out his phone, he checked the time. 12.03, a little over midnight. Well, Archie began, but Sam cut in. Come on, let's get to it. It's bloody freezing out here. He pulled down his beanie further on his head and sipped up his coat higher. Do the dare and let's get home where it's warm, all right? I nodded. I couldn't believe myself. I actually nodded. Despite all my internal senses going haywire, all of my gut telling me that this was the complete and wrong thing to be doing, I had nodded, sealing the dare and confirming my participation. The dare was on. They promised me they wouldn't be too far away that they would be near the creek at the west entrance of the woods, about 100 meters away from the clearing I was in. Then they left me, left me all alone, alone in the dark, alone in the unknown, alone with who knows what. I silently cursed myself. I tried to control my breathing. My heart was hammering in my chest. I let out a sigh, watching as my breath vapor steamed the cold air in front of my face. I just had to make an hour, one hour, one hour. I walked to the boulder and leaned against it and waited and waited. And that's where I am right now, still waiting. I actually shouldn't be here. I know I shouldn't. I let out a sigh, taking out my phone. Squinting at the sudden bright light of the display, I checked the time. 12.42, just 18 minutes. Time was going slowly. A loud noise interrupted me from my self-pitying thoughts. The sound of a twig snapping. Someone was moving near me. My eyes were wide, darting around trying to pierce the inky blackness of where my natural night vision couldn't see. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was too dry. The noise came again, this time from behind me. I spun around, trying to desperately squint through the darkness. I turned on my phone, turned on the flashlight, and shined it through the trees. It was Archie and Sam. I knew it. They were trying to prank me, try and make me scream. So then, they could tell all of their friends that Jake was scared of the dark and was such a coward. My fist clenched tighter around my phone. Archie Sam, I know it's you. I called out. And the noise came again from my left. I whipped around and saw it. There was a deer standing there looking at me. It was close, like two meters away from me. I could see its coarse fur and its twisting antlers and its eyes. Its eyes were wrong. Its eyes were a deep, dark red. A step backwards, those eyes, they had me transfixed. I couldn't stop staring into them. Then the deer started to move, jerky movements towards me. I was frozen in shock. I thought I heard a faint noise in the distance, some high-pitched noise, but it was for a split second, and I was left wondering if I had imagined it. The deer kept moving towards me, menacing, terrifying, 
I was paralyzed in fear. My body wanted to move, but I couldn't. All I could do was stand there as the deer kept stalking towards me so slowly. It wasn't a deer though. It was obvious, the eyes, the way it moved, the way it held its posture. It was clear that this was something else. What it was, I didn't know. It wasn't a deer for sure. Something was inside of it, wearing it, testing it out, and seeing how it worked. My body then came to life. I had control of my limbs, breaking free of its stare. I turned and fled. I wasn't paying attention to where I was running to, just anywhere from that. That thing, I looked behind me. It wasn't following me. It was standing in the clearing, watching me. I turned back to look where I was going. Too late. I tripped over a log, I think. My knees with pain. Pain seared through my left elbow. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the pain, and looked behind me. The woods were silent. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my own heartbeat and my heavy breathing. I heard footsteps, pounding footsteps coming towards me. Sam burst through the foliage, panting. It, it, he couldn't speak. His chest was heaving as he struggled to catch his breath. His hair and face was slick with sweat and he had lost his beanie on the run. It got Archie. It freaking got Archie, he managed to say. He noticed my look of confusion. The deer, the freaking deer, there was one there. We were watching it. I turned for a second and, and when I turned back, Sam broke into a hacking sob. He broke down. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. I realized this was the first time I had seen the big guy cry. When I turned back, there were bones on the floor. The deer had gone in and there was this thing, this freaking ugly ass creature. It, it was horrible, dude. Sam broke down again. I could do nothing but stay crouched where I was, shocked out of my wits. It transformed in front of me, dude. It had taken his skin, like in the horror movies. Skinwalkers. They take the skins of their victims. More of them freaking deer showed up then, like about five of them, dude. Five of them. Next to the thing wearing Sam's skin. And then I... Sam coughed and spat onto the ground. I ran. Ran like hell, dude. Oh my god. This freaking there. We should have never stayed. His tears stopped coming and he collapsed onto the log. I was breathing heavily still. I saw a deer too. I managed to whisper. It was in the clearing. I ran because it just didn't seem right. If I had stayed, I grounded to a halt. There was a deer walking towards us. Its eyes were red. Run! I yelled, leaping to my feet and grabbing Sam by the arm, dragging him with me. I could hear the deer following us. Then, a loud crunch, and I knew that if I looked back now, it wouldn't be a deer following us. It would be one of those creatures Sam had described. I didn't look back though, just kept running, running and running. Then we got lost. Branches whipped in our face, foliage shredded our trousers. If one of us tripped, the other would simply keep going, dragging the other along with them until they got their pace back. We got split up. I don't even know how. I think there was a tree and Sam was going around the left of it, but I was going to the right. I let go of his arm for a second, I think. When I looked to where he had been, he wasn't there. I had lost him. I kept running until I couldn't run any further. I staggered to a halt and leaned against the tree trunk, trying to catch my breath back. I took a step forward and heard a little brittle crunch from underneath my shoe. I stepped back and looked down at what I had stepped on. There was something white on the floor. I took my phone out and shined its flashlight on the floor. Bones. There were bones on the floor. 
shatter by me stepping on them. I shined the light around more. There was a skull near the bushes. I wanted to vomit. This must be all that was left of poor Archie. I sank to my knees and I started to sob. And I started to cry, uncontrollably, racking, sobs. I fell onto my backside, but felt something underneath me. I sat up and picked it up. It was Sam's beanie. Then it clicked. I span around, and of course, there was Sam. But it wasn't Sam, of course. His pupils were red, and that smile wasn't right. The thing wearing Sam's skin forced Sam's grin even wider, and it said in a deep snarl, I dare you run. Go on. Double there. When I was a child, it was just me and my mother. We lived in a property owned by my grandma, a three-story old farmhouse right at the fringe of the woods. It was far off the road down a long, unlit gravel driveway. It felt very isolated at night being so distant from any other houses. It was set in an area that wasn't inhabited for 30 years before we started living in it. Quite often, I was a fairly rambunctious child. So while my mom went off to work, I would occasionally skip the morning bus to school and stay home alone all day. The big house had a habit of feeling incredibly lonely. So I spent most of my time playing in the forest out in the back. Some distance into the woods, far enough that I could hear my mother when she called. There was a toppled pine tree which had crashed into another. An even larger trunk on its way down was now frozen there, forming a long arc over the forest floor I loved to climb up the jag stump at the base of this fallen tree and then steady myself to a point just above the middle. I was never able to make it all the way to the top because it just got too steep for me to continue any further and I had a bad habit of freaking out from how high up I was. One day I was sitting in my usual spot on the fallen tree, which was a good distance from the ground, just listening to the birds singing and simultaneously feeling the warmth of the sun on my neck. When I heard something strange from underneath that paralyzed me in shock, hey kid, I was gripped by a sudden strong surge of fear for a moment. The voice had come from directly underneath me. I strained to look down, but I couldn't see anything over the ledge. For a long time, I just sat there in absolute silence, and I was at the point where I was almost soon to convince myself that I had imagined hearing a man's voice at all. I know you can hear me. His voice was much louder this time, as I yelled something out and scrambled up the log a bit higher trembling nervously. I dug my fingernails into the bark and held tight for dear life. I sat there trying to collect my nerves for God knows how long. Even though I couldn't see it, the presence of the thing underneath me was still clear, it was much softer and more cautious this time. And when I listened closely, I swear I could hear the faintest echo of a human breathing. Gathering all my courage, I vowed to prove to myself that it was all my imagination by leaning over the ledge 
as far as I possibly could without slipping right off. Digging hard into the bark behind me, I stretched out along my arms and peered over, getting a full view of the empty forest floor and undergrowth when suddenly, come down here or I'll come up and grab you. It was so loud. It was as if it was being screamed right in my face. I released my grip on the tree in fright and plunged off the platform. I was saved only by grabbing a nearby branch and for one awful second, my bare legs dangle in the cool air. When I pulled myself up, I ran at full speed to the top of the collapsed pine, to the point I had never reached before. I sat there, just below the rustling canopy, pissing myself and staring at the distant base where the splinter wood rose, fully expecting at any moment to see someone crawling rapidly up the pine towards me. Instead, all I heard was the wind whistling and the leaves above and below me, and occasional snippets of bird song. It was about two hours before my mother got home and found me. After much worry, searching, trembling, and crying at the top of the fallen tree. Although this incident spooked both me and my mother, in time I somehow recovered, exhibiting the naive hard skin of a child. Even though I never went as far into the forest as I used to, I never again even approached that fallen tree. Once, when I was 12, I had the chore of taking firewood from the shed out back, just at the edge of the woods, and to bring it back inside the house. It was a tiresome job, and I always chose to do it at dusk, when the air was brimming with mosquitoes and a swampy fog that usually coated the lawn. By the time I had my last round, I would sprint back to the house, spooked. One of my least favorite things about this job was that the shed was full of barn owls. If you have never seen a barn owl's face staring at you from a dark roof corner, then you will know how uncomfortable that shed made me. One of these nights, it got mistier than it had ever been before. A thick silver fog covered everything, unlimited my line of sight to a short sphere around me. Even though the shed wasn't far from the house, I found myself feeling disoriented, and more than once, I walked in the wrong direction, both times for some reason, walking straight into the woods. By the time I had reached my last low, it was too foggy to see the street. My eyes stung in the moisture, and it made my vision blur. Lurching forward, I managed to walk headfirst into a tree. Doubling over and dropping all of the wood, I was bundling onto my feet with a hard crunch. As I went to pick them up with my foot throbbing pretty hard, I realized that the ground was too misty for me to see my own knees. I decided to head to the house since we had more than enough wood for one night. However, it was getting to be pretty dark, and I couldn't make out any signs of which direction I was heading in. Even though I cautiously walked for several feet in all directions, trying to figure out my position in the mist, I still couldn't figure out any point of identification. I couldn't even locate the fence or the gate, and the more I walked, the more I seemed to stumble into trees pine needles and mud crunching under my feet instead. After a while, I finally realized that I couldn't even find a shed anymore. Cursing myself for being so dumb while trying to ignore my thumping heart and sense that something else was at play, I became aware that I was lost somewhere in the forest. I then started screaming out for my mother at the loudest possible volume I could, but was only met with a resounding silence from the depths of the mist 
all around from where I stood, affirming that I had wandered too far from the house to be heard. As a deep panic started to settle on me, I noticed a glimpse of something pink moving against a nearby pine trunk. Coming closer, I saw that it was a ripped out square of pink paper. On it, there was an arrow pointing left. It looks vaguely like something my mom would make, I rationalized to keep me from getting lost. So I followed the direction set by that green arrow, shivering in the increasing cold. I kept walking for about five to 10 minutes before needing to stop to take a breath. My heart was pounding so fast, it was beginning to hurt. As I was sitting down, however, I spied what appeared to be another note hanging on a nearby trunk. I noticed this one was embedded with a long nail. It bore another arrow, this one pointing up, and a small, sloppy written note that said, this way. Despite my increasing panic, I convinced myself that these notes were my only shot at getting back before nightfall. I was desperate to get the hell out, and my eyebrows were cold with sweat, so I followed the green arrow to a point where I could just dimly make out another spot of pink up an incline of collapsed stumps and leaf litter. At this point, it was getting pretty dark, and I had to strain both my eyes just to see a few meters ahead of me, following the green arrows feeling more and more lost of where I was. I stumbled through the woods, groping out in the mist to feel for trees, even though I was terrified of something unseen grabbing my arm. I came across the third green note, which had another arrow pointing up again. This one led to a steep slope that I didn't recognize being anywhere near my house and it was with a poorly drawn smiley face right above it. At this stage I became too free to cope and started to cry there a little. As I slumped against the pine stump the possibility that I would be out in these woods all night was beginning to sink in like a syringe being driven into the veins within my arm. I caught a glimpse of another pink square in the near distance. Squinting hard despite the previous week's nonstop rain, I read it from afar. What I read made my blood turn cold. I stood to my knees, dead silently, wobbling on them in fear. My ears were sensitive to any tiny prickle of noise in the mist. For a long time, I stood there in the rolling fog, reading that horrible note over and over again, until a snapping stick somewhere behind me caused me to sprint, blindly, twigs snapping at my ankles and cutting up my face as I ran. Written on the note in big, green letters was my name. It felt like I was running for hours. All the while, the rain and mist lapped at the back of my neck like the decaying breath of someone running right behind me. Somehow, I made it back to the house. All the lights were off and I struggled to find the keys for a moment. When I found them, I bolted indoors and quickly crawled into bed where I remained unsleeping till morning. My mom just thought I had come inside and gone to bed and hadn't thought to leave the lights on. It was a miracle, aka some freakish coincidence that I even found the house that night at all. The final incident at that damn house was witnessed only by my mother. Up until then, she had never experienced any of the strange things as I had. Even though we mutually 
shared the same oppressive quality that the house's interior had on us and its placement in the woods. Although I was obviously never a popular kid, by living way out in the country in the opposite direction from everyone else at my school, I did make some tight friends in my first year of high school. One of these friends, Amanda was her name, invited me over one night and I accepted. My mother drove me out to the place, which was about three miles away, then drove back home. The night went well. We watched a horror movie, devoured some pizza, smoked a little pot. My mother went home alone, where she intended to get some writing done. She worked for a magazine at that point. It was about midnight when I received an off-putting text from mom in all caps. Is this a prank? I need to know immediately. Thinking it was some kind of joke, I texted back, calm yourself, is what a prank? She responded immediately, are you at the house? Of course I responded no. I didn't receive another message until around 3 a.m. when she told me to go to my grandma's in the morning and to not by any means there go home. I remember those drops of rain the day I went to my grandmother's and how terribly soaked I was when I finally got there. It was nearly two towns away. I had to fight the temptation to go home and drop off my bags. But mom's disturbing messages from last night were enough of a warning not to do so. When I arrived, mom and grandma were having lunch. At first, my mother seemed to be in some sort of a composed state, but when I got a better look at her, I noticed that all of the color had drained from her face and she was slightly trembling. At one point, she even sent a small glass crashing to the floor after flinching at the cat brushing around her ankles. It wasn't until later that night when my grandma was sound asleep that she told me what happened. She even went further as to forbid me from telling old grandma out of fear that it would horrify her superstitious soul too much. This was what happened the night when I was at Amanda's and she described it in detail. My mother was sitting on the first story in the living room where she sat on the couch by the fire. Curtains open to the view of the sunset on the canopy going over her latest draft. At first, it was so faint that she barely noticed it. But after a while, my mother became aware and vaguely irritated by tiny dumpy noises near her head at the window. When she went over to investigate, she saw a fat brown moth of a kind we often get at that place, buzzing madly into the glass. Reasoning that this was the cause of the sound, she returned to her work, however, feeling rattled in some way. It was when the noises started to get sharper and louder that she paid more attention and saw that rocks were being thrown at the window from the total blackness of the forest edge. She saw them appear from the shadows of the bush and then fall in an arc and bounce off the window. Looking carefully, she could see some cracks from where some heavy ones had hit, right beside where her head had been moments before. Captivated, she tried to peer into the darkness enough to make out where the rocks were being thrown from. Then, with a startled shock, she jumped back from the window as she saw me standing half behind a tree right near the window, grinning wide and staring at her. My one visible eye stretched wide open, showing all the white. She barely let out a scream, seeing her own daughter standing there, just staring and smiling. Not only did this figure not move or blink, it was standing by one of the nearest pines, far from where the rocks were shooting up out of the bush. 
as they continue to do so in a loud downpour. My face continued to press out at her, smiling, thinking this was all some kind of sick prank. My mother shouted my name at the top of her lungs. However, instead of responding, the mouth of this thing behind the tree just started moving as if it were saying words silently, really, really fast. Suddenly, it turned its head to the side and it seemed to be speaking with someone else behind the tree, my mom said, who couldn't be seen. But she could see a formless black shape hanging against the other side of the tree. The girl that looked like me kept staring at my mother and doing the silent, speed talking thing then turning and whispering to the thing next to her then she would turn back and start up again breaking the spell she suddenly pointed straight at my mother and started laughing my mother screamed and fled to my bedroom on the second story where she shut herself in and sat at the far end of the bed as the rocks began to pitter patter against the window downstairs. In my room, my mother said she did not feel safe. There was an awful smell and a weird humming noise in the walls as she described. She tried to pray for a time before giving up and just listening to the rocks pelt the walls and windows. Somewhere in the kitchen, she caught the distinct sound of a window actually smashing and the weird continuous humming. Listening more carefully, she could identify it as the softest hint of a mumbling voice. In absolute horror, she recognized the voice and then, too afraid to look, she tilted her head up to the closet door where an awful white face could be seen staring right at her with its mouth contorting and gapping in what sounded like Heidi sped up whispering. The closet door was only a meter from my mother. It then started to open slowly. My mother immediately bolted to the door only to fumble with the lock as bigger and bigger rocks came crashing through the window which burst apart in a spray of glass shards before finally getting out. Running out the house, completely keeping her eyes off the woods, getting into her vehicle and driving off. She said that she glanced back right at the end of the drive and she saw two unmistakable human forms standing at my broken bedroom window watching as her vehicle got further and further away from our house. This would be their final farewell as my mother never stepped foot in that place again. As my mother told this story, she broke down into tears. I didn't doubt her and I still don't. I truly believe that she experienced what she said she did. It was also quite clear that we were done living in that house for once and for all. I only went back once with my dad, who I rarely see now. He came from another state to help us move. Mom had already found a place in town and moved in. My dad and I just loaded up his truck with all that was left inside there. It was silent, sunny morning when we removed all the stuff and emptied the place. I wish I could say there was some closure, some final spooking to cap it all off, but there wasn't. It was just a relief to be out of there. There are, however, two things that I have to mention. When we checked the house for any signs of intruders, we found that several windows, including one in my bedroom and the kitchen, had been smashed and rocks were lying on the floor. Two, Dad went out into the trees for a bit to take a leap. When he came back, 
he asked me how long we had the swing set for. Needless to say, we never had a swing set. So I was fairly unsettled to discover that in the week since we had been gone, someone had assembled a rope swing set from one of the highest branches of the old pine over the ridge against which was the fallen log I had stopped climbing many years ago. It was obviously new rope and a nicely polished sanded down wooden set. Dad, wanting to keep my mind from recent events, said that a neighbor maybe set it up, not realizing it was on our property. Of course, he knew as well as I did that we had no neighbors for at least a mile in any direction. There were no houses in all that space and never in my time living there did I ever see any other signs of humans living. But I let it all go and was pleased enough just to say good riddance to that horrible place as we drove off for good. For the most part, I found it best to try and forget what happened at that place. Sometimes, I just can't help but ponder it, even though it's been long enough now that I no longer feel scared talking about it, but for a long while, I couldn't. My grandma just recently sold the house to a new family, that being a young couple and their little son, shortly after we moved out. Despite my mother's desperate insistence that it be left empty, now she refuses to talk about what happened altogether. I'm less anxious about it, even though sometimes I can't help but let my imagination get the better of me. All I can do is think of that old house, the fallen down tree, the new family that moved in, and the swing out back, gently spinning in the breeze as that little boy toddles, obviously, towards it. I'll never forget that night. I am a park ranger, and that is all you will learn about me, aside from this story. During the summer of 2008, I had been assigned to a watchtower in the middle of a heavily forest area. Most nights, it was uneventful, and I tended to just read a book as I waited for my shift to end. However, this night, when I started my shift, the guy I took over from was shaken up, concerned. I asked what was wrong. All he did was shake his head and said, there are things in the woods. He didn't say anything else and just left me standing there like a jackass jerk. Well, I set up for the night and took out my book. It was the mailman and I found myself surprised by how much I enjoyed it. Sometime around an hour into my shift. Something struck the window. I jumped up and quickly sat the book down. Before checking it out, I had expected it was either a big bug or some poor bird. It was a bird all right, but not what I had been expecting at all. This bird was dead long before it had collided with the window. Both wings torn right off and stripped of all feathers. It was bound together with straps made from long grass blades. This was the clear evidence that this was man-made. I quickly took out my flashlight and began scanning the area beneath me. I couldn't see much through the woods. However, as I did a quick double take, I swear, I saw a dark shape dart away from the light. I feel this needs some elaborating. I could barely make out anything, but when I brought my light over this thing, I only got a brief glimpse. I literally couldn't describe it for the life of me. This thing was fast. Too fast. Alright, listen up you punks. If you're out there, show yourself right now. I used my most commanding voice possible. 
nothing. As I drew my pistol, I heard the radio crackle. Naturally, I went to check and picked up the receiver. As I held it up to my ear, I could only hear static. So, I at first assumed there was a glitch. But right as I decided to set it down, something stopped me. Call it intuition, something just wasn't right. And then I realized what it was. I could hear something over the radio. It was faint, so I really had to strain to hear it. Slowly, I could make out what sounded like faint, low humming. There was a pattern to it, a steady beat that started low, building up, then carefully dropped back down in an instant. I don't know how long I was listening to that humming sound, but eventually I turned off the radio, ready to radio it in. Then I realized I could still hear the humming. Without a second thought, I drew my pistol and turned around on my heel before steadily walking back outside. That humming sound sounded like it was all around me. Following that same pattern, I still had a strain to make it out, but there was no question it was there. I swiveled around, pistol aimed at empty air. Every part of me was screaming to call for backup, but I wasn't sure what I needed backup for. I needed some proof of what I was dealing with. So I waited, on guard and ready, and then it stopped. As I became accustomed to the silence, I couldn't hear anything, not even a bug chirping. Cautiously, turning my flashlight back on, I pointed it down at the base of the tower. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Then, I heard a creak. I immediately spun around, processing this information. At first, I dismissed it as the wood, but then, there was another creak, and another. Something was up here with me. It took me a few moments to realize that it was just around the corner. In that moment, fight or flight kicked in full gear, and I chose fight. I rounded the corner and found nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was nervous, but I still had a job to do, and with no other option, I decided to call for backup, which I should have done that a long time ago. I realized that when I saw the receiver had been cut right off, I stared, dumbfounded by a few moments before grabbing my walkie-talkie instead. But when I turned it on, all I got was a harsh whine right in my ear, which caused me to drop it as I recovered. Once I had, I immediately tried to find it, but it was gone. My situation was desperate. I was now completely cut off with some thing or other that seemed to defy all sense. If I was going to make it out of this, I had to stay put and wait for someone to come check on me. I still had my pistol drawn, waiting and waiting. I then quickly shined my flashlight outside one last time. And this time, I finally saw them standing among the trees staring up at me. They had been avoiding me all this time, so to see so many of them, you might be wondering what they were. And I'd rather not tell you for my sake. I was at my limit then and screamed, turning off my flashlight and pointing my gun right at the door. There, I stayed for the rest of my shift, unwilling to move from that spot. I consider it a miracle I lasted for the rest of my shift. By the time someone finally arrived to see why I wasn't checking in, I poured out every single thing I had gone through. At first, the other ranger looked at me like I was crazy, but when he asked 
if I had any proof, something landed on the roof of his vehicle. It was another dead, naked, and wingless bird wrapped in grass. Needless to say, we booked it right out of there. When I got back and made a report about what happened, I demanded to speak with the last guy who had been on the previous ship. I really wanted him to have it for not warning me of what was out there. But here's the thing, we never found him. We searched high and low, checked every single record for a trace. We tried to look up his name if when we could remember it, but it seemed like he never existed in the first place. So, what the hell took his shift? I live right next to a Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and it only takes about 25 to 30 minutes. I have made this trip dozens of times and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest however about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. This day I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to and when I left it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was 10 steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure of what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation. So I whispered, hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my voice, hello? My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I was gonna faint, hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply. Hello? 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 As my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale. And I realized, for the first time, that there was no typical forest sound. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets. Nothing. I stood there, terrified waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I had enough and was wielding my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard some rustling in the bushes 20 feet to my left. I watched as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush as it came further out and stood up on twos. I took off I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, 
lay down and thought about what happened. My mom came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her, I guess. I was afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. But this terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds got quiet. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy. Amy. Come here. Hello? Stop it. My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature that they called Yi Naudroshi, or he who goes on all fours, or a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required and that this witch had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me and that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching on my window. Then, a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, it started calling my name, but drawing it out really far, like, Amy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it into my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is this thing seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that. Many of you who love paranormal stuff may have already heard of the word Nagual here in Mexico and I would guess that also on some other countries in Latino America we call that way people who can shapeshift into animals. Well here's my story. It was a cold night I remember because it was really weird for it to get cold on that side of the country. This was in my parents house in a small pueblo or small town and back in the day it was one of the last houses outside of town. Not so many neighbors but a lot of trees and nature around. The house has a long backyard where we used to have sheep. At one side a small water stream and trees to the other side. The sheep then started to bleat very loud. Something we could call screams. My father then went to give a check on a window 
in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly. And in a low, urgent voice, he told my mom, Ve agarra a tu padre y a tus hermanos y diles que vengan ya ahorita. Go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. They were four brothers, my grandfather and my father. When everyone was there, a few minutes later, my father started to tell us what he saw. In the barn, we had ten sheep. At the moment, my father gave a look. All of them were together in just one corner. At the center, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense. But he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one sheep there. This one sheep was screaming really bad. Then, my grandfather told my mom to keep us inside of the house and to keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. So he made some kind of prayer holding his machete. So his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. He then went outside. That's when my grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, Vete de aquí. No tienes nada que ver aquí. Deja esta casa. Go away. You have nothing to do here. Leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming by the way. And when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and raise its head up towards my family. This thing was only staring at them. Not a single noise, and also no red or shining eyes. Only the shadow looked like it was looking at them. So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock, he picked it up from the ground, and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation, but I guess this thing was not that strong. Or maybe because it was six of us, and we all had machetes. But when the rock hit it, this being turned its back and ran away to the forest, running on all four legs, like an animal would. They then approached the sheep, and my grandpa said how the sheep was on the ground, but it was still alive, but it was completely unskinned. It was horrifying at least. My grandfather then sacrificed it to stop the suffering. After that night, a family friend told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was a Nagwat. He told us he spoke to that man and he told him to leave the town. Indeed, we never happened to live something similar after that. I saw some videos about skinwalkers on TikTok. So I started watching videos about them on YouTube and there was a whole podcast where this guy just read stories about them from Reddit and other stories that people submitted. Our ward at church purchased a piece of land way back in the day. It's seriously just wooded area with a little bit of swamp. We would always go there for campouts and scouts and at night when it was pitch black we would all play manhunt well one time we all got down to one person whose name was david growing up he was super fast and he would hide really good so nobody could ever find him he would always end up being the last person well one time it was down to david and we had split up and gone way deep in the forest towards the swamp because it seems like it was impossible to find him. We thought he might have gone a little bit further than we normally go. We started getting into some more muddy and wet terrain as we get closer to a swamp-like area where the water is most likely shin deep. And we saw David way out in the swamp and he wasn't wearing a shirt. 
and with the spotlight on him, he looked super pale. But he just stood there and didn't say a word. You could seriously tell something was off. Then, all of a sudden, we heard David from behind us, yelling, trying to get our attention, so we would keep trying to chase him down. Meaning, what we saw in front of us was definitely not him. So being a bunch of 12 to 17 year old boys, we started yelling and running back to the campsite as fast as we could. Nobody believed us. In fact, for years everybody made fun of it, calling the ghost of David. But then I started listening to these stories and every single one of them sounds just like what happened in some way or another. I am Navajo. We had an incident with an unwelcome visitor in our home. Here's what happened. My cousin is sleeping over. He's the same age as me. We're both 13 at this time. We're in my room talking and hanging out. It is around maybe 11 p.m. It is a pleasant summer evening. So my window is wide open. It's also pretty dark outside, and my dad is in the living room watching TV. But as always, he's dozed off on the couch. My mom has already gone to bed. My cousin and I are keeping it down, but we're not ready yet to call it a night. All of a sudden, we hear the screen door to the front of the house open and slam shut. We think it's my dad. My mom. She tells us the next day she hears footsteps on the carpet. Whoever it is, she says, goes through her room and towards the bathroom. So she naturally assumes it's my dad. Then she realizes that she's unable to move, as if she's paralyzed. Still, in my room, my cousin and I again hear the screen door open and slam, only this time more loud. It wakes up my dad, and he comes to my bedroom to check on us. Finding us both there, he wants to know which one of my friends just slipped out of the house. It takes a few minutes, but we convince him we were by ourselves, and that we thought it was him going in and out. I can see by the look on his face, he's not really buying it. But he has to admit, we don't seem to be lying. He then leaves. And as he's closing the door to my room, he tells us to stay out of trouble and go to sleep. All we could do is shrug. The next morning, my mom tells us about what she heard and how she could not move. She also tells us that the second time the door slams, she then hears what sounds like a horse galloping by her bedroom window. She then has all of us pray, and now, every year, we hike up the mountain to a high point and we pray for protection from evil. This event happened just south of Olaka, Arizona within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face 
as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face, like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later, on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limped and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house and they summoned the local medicine man who came and said some prayers over him. But he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and bless the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body. I was only 17 at the time. On this specific night, I woke up feeling thirsty. I'm just lying there, staring into the dark and deciding if it's worth the effort to get up and get something to drink. I'm sure we all been in that situation plenty of times before. So tonight, when you're in bed and you're questioning if you should get up and get some water, remember this story. So all I can hear is the clock ticking down the hallway and the muted silence. It's just way too quiet. I check the time on my cell phone. It's a few minutes short of 2.30 a.m. I then decide to sit up and get out the bed. I then make my way towards the door of my bedroom. It's really dark. I go down the hallway towards the kitchen. As I get out to the living room, I chance to look to my right and in the direction of the front door to the house. The only light is coming from a street light that is down at the end of the property and not all that far away. There, at the inside of the door, inside the house, I see this figure standing there. Its face at first appears human, then serpent-like, and then back to human, as if it can't decide how it wants to present itself to me. For some reason, I'm just standing there taking this all in. I'm not afraid, but I don't feel like I have any control over my senses either. And I'm not sure if I could move or have said anything, even if I wanted to, which at the time, I can't say I did. As the two of us are standing face to face, he assumes his human features. His face is fully painted a thick stripe of black across his eyes and the rest white. He has a feather woven into the hair at the top of his head. He looks young, not much older than me. He is bare chested, not real muscular, but definitely cut. His torso is painted red. His lower half is covering what looks to be khaki colored pants well-worn and faded, cut off and frayed just below the knees. He is barefooted, but his wrists and ankles are wrapped with animal skin of some sort. It is hairy and light, colored like that of a coyote. He doesn't say anything to me, not aloud anyway, 
but I do hear his words in my head. Although for the life of me, I can't remember any of it. It's as if he at the same time, with this cold stare of his, is pinching away layers of my memory. I do remember wondering why he is in my house and having the idea that he was expecting to find someone else. Just then, without even thinking about it, my cell phone in my hand, I begin dialing 911. With the phone ringing, I look back to the painted stranger. He gives me a thin smile and vanishes through the door, which by the way, is closed and locked. To the other side, I hear what sounds like a horse galloping away. I move over to the door and pull it open. I see this figure taking long strides across my yard, away from the light and out into the street. There's a car parked on the other side. He goes around to the passenger side, ducks down and into the car, and it drives off. It all happens in a matter of seconds. I then realize there's a police operator talking back to me from the phone. I tell her there was someone in my house, but I leave out the part about his changing appearance and leaving through a closed door. The operator, or whoever she was, tells me not to worry about it. She says that I'm not the first caller of this kind on this night. She tells me to say a prayer, telling me that she too is Navajo and to go back to bed and that I won't be bothered by it anymore. Before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me. But I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy. At the end of my school years, I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, 
then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I had heard. But it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Sugar Booger. I looked up where I heard it coming from, which was from the woods. But there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later. It was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar burger. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real 
They look like giant teddy bear eyes, but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment, I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket, that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down on my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw. That if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again. But this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it, then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes, the same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. 
One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there, but as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six-year-old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach, my eyes were widened, and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head, and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes, and that same demented smile. Only this time, I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now, they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me, and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would happen if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw. And then they started to pray 
and checked that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. Alex, Jim, and I decided to go camping. We set up camp, decided to just drink and talk, and that's what we did all night. About anything and everything that came to mind. It was 3 a.m. and we were still chatting away until we heard something in the trees. Some kind of cracking sound. Could be a bird, said Jim. A big damn bird, I replied with slight confusion. Could be a monkey, joked Alex. We shared a laugh and ignored the sound and continued to talk. Another half hour had passed and the sound had completely stopped. I wonder what that was anyway, Alex said. Well, I have no clue, I replied, taking a sip of my beer. Well... I hope it's gone, because I need a piss, Jim said, standing up and heading to the trees. A few minutes passed, and Alex and I grew concerned. We best go look for him, said Alex. He sounded a little annoyed. We stood up and walked in the direction Jim went. It didn't take long to find the first drop of blood and then the trail that led deeper into the woods what the fuck i said shaking we began shouting for him following the trail i was the first to see him standing in a clearing about 10 meters away he was facing away from us we tried shouting but we got no response we walked closer and we noticed him twitching violently. He was covered in blood and clearly beat up. I was about to say his name once again, but the word got stuck in my throat when I saw the bloody pile of meat on the floor next to him. I think Alex saw it too as he also went silent. As if by magic, Jim turned to us and we saw his face was literally hanging off and underneath was pale gray skin. 
We could also see a burning orange eye and part of a wide mouth with long, sharp teeth where the skin was peeled off. Besides from this, Jen looked normal, aside from a few cuts and bruises. As we stared into the single orange eye, the thing wearing Jim's skin pushed the peeling flesh back on. And there, Jim stood totally normal. Hey guys, let's go for a walk, he said in his normal voice. This thing also seemed to demonstrate excitement. Alex and I turned. We ran past our campsite and got straight in the car, parked about a mile from our tent. I'm not sure if this Jim followed us. I swear I could hear thumping footsteps behind Alex and I. We reached the car and jumped in, pouring sweat and heaving. I started the car faster than ever before and drove at nearly 100 miles per hour all the way back home. When we arrived and got out, I walked around the back of the car only to see scratch marks on the bumper. I shivered as I realized how close he must have been. This was over 40 years ago. Alex never quite recovered and last I heard he was living in a mental hospital. I was thinking I may have to join him as I'm pretty sure I saw Jim a few weeks ago at a bar. I thought I was mad until I did some research. I would have done it sooner but I'm an old man now and we didn't have Google back in the day. I'm pretty sure we encountered a skinwalker and it may have found me after 40 years and I think it wants to finish the job and now it's pretty strange that I keep getting letters asking to catch up from my old friend Jim for a few months I've been having a feral cat that comes to my back porch looking for food. I first saw him in October around 6 p.m. when the sun was going down and I had walked to the back door to take a smoke outside. I could see him through the double window that looks out onto the swamp beyond. He was sitting patiently as if he had been waiting for me. His black greasy fur reflecting the colors of the sun. When he saw me approaching he stepped closer to the window and stood on his two back legs and started to paw wildly at the window. I chuckled and walked back to my fridge, pulling out some leftover chicken breast from the night before. I grabbed an old plastic dish from the cabinet and I tore the chicken apart into bite-sized pieces. I returned to the back door. I opened it only enough for me to squeeze out so that he wouldn't bolt into the house. If he did, I knew I would regret it letting him slip inside only to possibly infest my home with blood sucking fleas and to tear up my furniture. I placed the dish down and he pranced towards it, scarfing it down like it was his first meal in weeks. I looked at him closer through his long fur and could see how thin he was. His legs looked like skin and bone and his cheeks looked sunk in, causing his eyes to protrude out grossly. It was then that I noticed his tar colored eyes that had no glint to them, no shine from the setting sun. It reminded me of those computer screens that don't reflect pesky sunlight glare 
coming from your window. I felt uneasy, worried now that he may attack me. However, he looked at me once and blinked slowly before racing down the porch stairs and disappearing into the wooded swamp. I started to wake up every morning only to see the dead corpse of some poor animal when I would take my routinely first smoke of the day. It started with little animals, birds, mice, and other small rodents. I always figured it was just the way that cat was thanking me for feeding him when he came, which was only a couple of times a week. Even though I only saw him a few times, there was always a dead animal on the porch step every morning. I thought it was silly that some old cat would bring me presents every morning. After about a month, the corpses began to get bigger. I was finding more bigger rats and the occasional possum. I started to think it was strange that this cat seemed to catch his dinner just fine, but still came to me for scraps. I always brushed it off though, seeing as it wasn't doing me any harm, and I had no roommates who may have been disturbed by it. However, on one particular cold and foggy morning, I walked to the back deck to have my cigarette, and I looked down to look for my present. There was nothing there. I could feel my heart flutter. I was worried that something may have happened to my little buddy. That feeling quickly left and I felt my stomach drop as I looked over the railing to see my lawn filled with bodies. I placed a hand over my mouth to catch my gasp. The sight was disgusting and a less than pleasant encounter when all I wanted was to enjoy a smoke. After that occurrence, the dead animal started to appear once again on the back deck. Part of me felt relieved that my cat was okay, while the other part of me felt like something was terribly off. Sometime in January, I woke up in the middle of the night, groggy as hell, but with a strong craving to have a smoke. I walked down the hall and paused at the window overlooking the backyard, and I saw a pale figure that reflected the moonlight. I paused, and my eyes widened. Suddenly, I was no longer groggy and the urge to smoke disappeared. The figure looked up at me and I froze. My breathing stopped. I could see its sunken in eyes staring at me and its spine protruding from its pale skin that had patches of fur peppered. It looked very strange, almost human-like, hunched over while standing on two legs. I panicked and I could feel my body growing hot as my heartbeat quickened. After staring at me a little longer, it turned around to crawl over the fence and then it walked away on its two legs. I went back to bed completely terrified. I woke up the next morning and rub my eyes, releasing a big yawn. I thought to myself, what a crazy dream I had. I got up from bed and walked downstairs to make myself a pot of French press coffee. I grabbed my pack of smokes and my mug and walked out the back door. I walked to the rail with my mug and crossed my arms and leaned over. I instantly dropped my mug and could hear it shatter on the concrete below. Time felt like it had slowed 
as I looked around to see corpses lacerated and splayed across my yard. The black feral cat was strategically in the middle of all the dead bodies. No mercy was spared to any of those animals. I felt my stomach heave and I threw up what was left of my dinner from last night. I felt a chill run down my spine as I remembered what I had seen the night before and I no longer believed it was a dream. I quickly walked back to the door and locked it shut behind me. It felt surreal and I couldn't imagine that this was happening to me but to my dismay it was. I couldn't be bothered to clean all the bodies. I was too fearful to walk out that door. I stayed inside the house for the rest of the day on my computer looking for solutions to my problem. Of course I found nothing but nonsense about some beings called rakes, wendigos, and skinwalkers. I strongly felt that this was some person playing a massive prank on me and I desperately wanted to believe that was the case. I fell asleep at the table in front of the back door. Being the light sleeper that I am, I woke up to a gentle but loud knock at the door, followed by a few more. I immediately sprang up and swiveled around. I pulled the blinds away from the door just enough to peer out the window. Nothing. I walked to the window beside the door and shrieked at what I saw before me. The creature I had just seen the night before had pressed its hands and face against the window and was breathing heavily with a wicked smile plastered against its face. I ran to the counter and snatched my keys, running out the front door to dash to my car. As I got in, I began backing out. That's when I saw the creature come around the side of the house, only to stop when it saw me backing away. It then stood up on its two legs and gave me a slow wave showing off its nasty pointed teeth and its disgusting smile. I retreated to my sister's home, which was about 30 minutes away, and I busted through the front door with no explanation. She came running down the stairs with her boyfriend following close behind her. She flicked the lights on and could see how disturbed I looked taking me to the guest room downstairs she told me I was welcome to stay as long as I needed after refusing to tell her what went wrong I felt crazy after what I saw part of me still believing it wasn't real and another part afraid she would think I was crazy a few days passed and I was beginning to feel more at ease my sister was making breakfast by the time I woke up and I nodded to her and her boyfriend as I sat down at the table when there was a ring at the doorbell. I went to go see who was there as I saw my sister was busy and her boyfriend was enjoying a little small talk with her. I opened the door and was surprised to see no one was there. A putrid smell struck my nostrils. I looked down to see the half rotten body of my feral cat. I was on an assignment for the army making my way up from San Antonio Texas to Tacoma 
Washington. It was a long drive and they gave me six days to report to my new unit, but I didn't mind. I love road trips. There is nothing like the freedom of exploring the world by yourself. The first day of my journey, I planned to get as much driving in as possible so I could spend a few days in Utah. A sort of mini vacation, you could say. This was January and the days were short, so maximizing the amount of daylight I had was crucial. I got up extra early that morning, carried the last of my bags out to my Corolla, signed out of my old unit, and hit the road at roughly 5 a.m. It was an amazing day. I saw the landscape transform around me as I went further west than I had ever been in my life. From the San Antonio metropolitan area to the savannas of the Edwards Plateau to the pancake flat farmland of the Great Plains region, America's head basket. Finally, the farms opened up into prairie and I saw the welcome to New Mexico, the land of enchantment sign. Now I really was in the middle of nowhere. Continuing on US Route 380, I eventually found myself in Roswell. I could have gotten a few more hours of driving in and made it to Albuquerque, but I figured since I was in no rush, I might as well see what Roswell had to offer. Who knows if I would get a chance to visit again. As a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, as Mr. Baldwin would say, I took a self-guided tour of the shops and attractions. The next day, I continued to Albuquerque, then westward on Interstate 40. By the time I reached Gallup and started northbound on US Route 491, I still had two hours of driving left before crossing the border into Colorado and another 45 minutes before I would get to Cortez. My plan stopped for the night. However, my daylight was already running out as sunset was at 6 p.m. I got Starbucks and refreshed myself for the final stretch. It was supposed to be easy, just a straight shot, but looking back on it now, I figured that had I decided to stop in Albuquerque instead of Roswell the night previous, I would have already been in Colorado by now and possibly be making my way into Utah. I would have saved myself from what was waiting for me on that desolated highway. Route 491 stretched far into the Navajo Nation. On either side of me were endless expanses of prairie bookended by dark indigo mountains on the horizon. To my left, the sky glowed a faint orange purple, the light slowly dying down like embers in a fire until finally plunging the land into darkness. Every now and then, I would see the forlorn headlights of another car passing by, which gave me a bit of relief that I wasn't alone. I also had my road trip playlist on to keep me company and call me ironic, but Hotel California was plain. After passing the small, lonely town of Newcomb, the next piece of civilization would be Shiprock. However, between the two was a 36 mile stretch of absolute nothingness an abyss I had to cross and I was not ready for what I was about to witness. After several miles and having not seen another car on the road, I saw something strange emerge from the horizon, barely lit by the moonlight. I thought it was a road sign at first. Then, as I came closer, I realized it was a person walking on the shoulder of the road, heading in my direction. I squinted 
trying my hardest to focus on the figure. In the darkness, I could tell they were wearing a poncho of some sort, with long, black hair flowing down past their chest. Who could be walking out here, all alone, at night, I thought. Whoever it was, they had no lights, no reflectors, no strobes of any kind to signal to passing vehicles that they were there. And they walked on the pavement, dangerously close to oncoming traffic. I pulled to the left a bit, giving them a wide berth. Suddenly, my stereo cut out, as if I had turned it off. The screen went completely dark, and my phone disconnected from Bluetooth. While this was unusual, it did happen from time to time. So, I thought nothing of it. As I approached, I saw the person raise their right arm, as if to flag me down and hitch a ride. No, 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 I thought. There's no way that's happening, buddy. As my headlights swept by, I realized it was a man, dressed in a button-up shirt, a poncho, jeans, and cowboy boots. His large belt buckle glinted as the lights passed him. But in that split second, I realized with shock that not only were his eyes painfully wide open, but they seemed to be tracking me. Somehow, he was able to see me through the glare of my headlights and look me dead in the eyes, not breaking contact until I passed. I was shaken for a bit, but my nerves gradually subsided. My stereo turned back on, and my music continued playing. I brushed everything off as simply my imagination. The darkness and the shadows playing tricks on my mind. Besides, the man was behind me. I figured he must have been drunk. Indian reservations, sadly, had high rates of alcoholism. I looked in my rear view mirror, and... He was gone. I couldn't see him. Maybe he's too far behind me? No, that couldn't be. It must be too dark. Maybe. I drove on, trying to figure out what just happened, but at the same time, forcing myself not to think about it. Just when I thought I had moved on, I saw another shape in the distance. Getting closer, I realized it was another figure. Another person walking alone at night? There's no way. They walked along the shoulder of the road, swaying back and forth. Slowly, I could make out that this person. Then, I saw what looked like long black hair reaching down past the chest. No, there's no way. It was a man, the same man. But how? The man raised his arm again trying to flag me down. What does this guy want? I kept up my pace, with no intention of stopping for any reason. Just like last time, my stereo turned off again. Suddenly, the man leaped out into the road, arms waving frantically. I swerved into the left lane, narrowly avoiding him. In my headlights, I noticed he had the same wide-eyed look his gaze locked into mine. I also saw that his clothes did not look as they did on the first encounter. Once they were clean, if not well worn, but now they were soiled and tattered, rags barely hanging onto his withered frame. His hair was wild and unkempt, with clods of dry dirt stuck in the locks, but his eyes remained the same. My heart nearly burst through my chest at the sudden shock. Hyperventilating, I slowed down and glanced into the rearview mirror to make sure he was alright. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see. The man was running and he was sprinting towards me. I centered the wheel and accelerated hoping to get as much distance from him as possible. But as I continued to speed up, 
so did he. Faster and faster I drove, but every time I looked in the mirror, I would still see him right behind me, perfectly keeping pace, his body tinted red by my tail lights. I could feel my head throbbing and my hands getting slick with sweat on the steering wheel. I was sick to my stomach. There's no way I looked forward, hoping to see a faint glimmer of light from the town ahead, but I was still too far away. I looked back at the rear view mirror and the man was gone. I should have been relieved, but I knew better. Where did he go? I looked around, hoping to regain a visual on him. I couldn't see anything. Taking a deep breath, I refocused on the road, but kept my guard up. Just keep driving, I told myself, only a few more miles to go. Out of the corner of my right eye, I saw something. Another shape. It wasn't the man. At least, I didn't think so. I glanced over, bracing myself for whatever was going to meet my sight. It looked like an animal, some kind of animal, though I couldn't make out exactly what it was. Under the moonlight, I could see it running alongside my car, its limbs reaching out in long strides, its back undulating like a dog. Closer and closer it came. The closer it was, the more of it I could see, little by little. Then I noticed its limbs were far too long for its body. Its body was too short. It had no tail. The head was round and from it came a trail of long black hair. I slammed my foot on the gas, pushing my car's engine harder than it had ever been pushed before. By now, I was clocking well over 110, but this creature, it was keeping up. It wasn't faced, it simply ran faster and faster to match my speed. Just what was this thing? How could anyone or anything run this fast? This entity seemed to have endless stamina. Just how long could it keep this up? Just how much faster could it go? Soon, I knew my car would hit its top speed. And then what? How long could it maintain that before breaking down? It wouldn't be long until my engine overheats. But regardless, I would eventually run out of gas. And when I do, what would happen if that thing got me? At 120 miles per hour, my car had reached its limit. This was the fastest I could go, but the creature continued its pursuit. My temperature gauge was approaching the red, and so was my tachometer. I couldn't keep this up any longer. Suddenly, like the beacon of a lighthouse on a tumultuous sea, the first light of ship rock came into view. It was close, so close. If I could just go a little longer, I could make it into town, to safety. I pressed on. I fixed my eyes on the lights, growing brighter on the horizon. They bloomed outwards, glimmering in the night air. Though it was a small town, it was a sight for sore eyes in my situation. Looking in my periphery, I saw the undulation of the creature's spine as it kept pace with my car. But now it was slipping away, steering far and further from the road. It suddenly hit me just how hard my heart was beating. Beads of sweat dripped down my face. I looked over. The creature was gone. But this time, the feeling of dread had also gone with it. My stereo once again turned back on, and as my music resumed, I took a breath of deep sigh of relief. I let off the accelerator. This man, the creature, 
whatever it was, it was finally gone for good. Having white knuckled the steering wheel the whole time without realizing it, my hands were extremely sore, but I was glad to have made it through. A week later, I told another soldier in my unit about what I experienced. Being originally from Albuquerque, she was familiar with the Native American legends of the Southwest. The conversation steered towards a certain creature that she would not dare speak the name of. She also told me that the highway I took was well known for all sorts of paranormal phenomena. Google what Route 491 used to be called and everything will make sense. Be careful out there. <laughs>